Well, thank you. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, FWE. Thank you for having me here. Uh, I feel like I'm about 10 feet off the ground right now because I had the privilege of listening to some of you pitch earlier this morning uh, in your uh, requests for financing and um, otherwise exceptional entertaining uh, uh, elements. Uh, and so I'm going to apologize right at the front that I'm going to make some comments about some of the presentations that I saw. If I don't make a comment about you, it's because I didn't see you. Um, so I'll have to come back and, uh, and see you if you come back next year. But I guess this is a one-year gig, right? You don't come back a second time, or do you? Oh, all right. Okay. Well, if any, if, if the rest of you are like what I saw this morning, it is unbelievable. Um, I must say, though, when I looked at the agenda and the program that Christine, uh, Christina sent to me, and it said I'm supposed to talk about, uh, I'm supposed to provide comments on wisdom and inspiration, I thought, oh my God, if there's ever a confirmation of being old. <laughs> you know, it's like the Lifetime Achievement Award. You never want the Lifetime Achievement Award, right? Because it's sort of like, that's the end. And so I've changed the title. I've changed the title. So the title is Musings from a Path Well-Traveled, Journey Not Finished. Okay? <laughs> so it might be inspiration. It, I don't know if it'll be that wise. Um, but I'll come back in about 20 years and do the um, wisdom and inspiration thing. Uh, I will say, though, that I, I make it a point every day, always have, probably since I was a very tiny kid, of finding inspiration and optimism every day in everything. And I find it in the weirdest ways. Uh, and I'm going to share one little one with you because I'm a bit of a card gal, um, still old-fashioned, do the hard copy card. And I, f I found this one, and I, I carry it around with me now. Um, I actually carry it when I travel and in my purse. Uh, and it says, uh, one of the hardest things to realize, she said, is that our someday is right now. So it's within that context of our someday is right now that I want to share a few stories with you in a framework of three big themes, if you will. Perspective, performance, and promise. So I'll touch on each one of those. So perspective. Uh, the perspective that we bring to any issue, any problem, any situation is hugely important. Quite often, I see people, I, I do it myself, guilty as charged, we act or react without fully understanding what our own perspective is. How do we actually see this issue? Why is this issue important to us? And more importantly, we quite often act, react, perform, uh, and try to resolve an issue without understanding the perspective of the other person. Whether that other person is a banker, a customer, a, our children, our spouse, although those perspectives don't really matter. Um, but we quite often, by the way, you can't say any of this outside in this room, right? Um, we quite often uh, react and, and judge situations without fully understanding the impact of our own perspective and the perspective of the other people or person, uh, persons that we are involved with. I'm going to tell you a little story uh, along those lines. It goes back many, many years. My kids, who are now, um, I think, as old as some of you, um, were five, seven, and nine. And I was on the doorstep of moving from practicing lawyer to becoming managing partner. And in, the, in the law firm. And I knew that that was going to be a huge change for our family. And because I went from being a Vancouver-based practicing lawyer to the managing partner of a firm that at that point had four offices and I had aspirations of doing other things. So Brad and I thought uh, it was really important to discuss this with the kids. Let them know that mommy was going to be away a little bit more, mommy was going to have a new job, et cetera, et cetera. So we decided we'd do this when we were up at one of our urban camping trips up in Alice Lake outside Squamish there. So there we are walking through the, the campground hand in hand. I thought, okay, this is a good time. I'll raise it. So mommy's uh, going to take a new job, and uh, it's going to mean that I'm going to travel a bit, and I'm going to be away a little bit more. The first reaction of the children was, did you have a fight with your boss, i.e., Changing jobs is not a good thing. You know, so I hadn't even thought, hadn't even thought that was going to come into their mind. And so I explained, no, no. Well, why would you want to do this? Well, because uh, I can learn new things. I'm going to learn new things. 
I can engage with people that I wouldn't otherwise engage with. I'm going to be able to see a lot more of the business world and the legal world. And when I'm finished, I was getting all excited. When I'm finished being managing partner, you guys, I can do whatever I want to do. Without breaking stride, our seven-year-old said, you mean like work in a pet store? <laughs> and right at that moment, and I can still put myself right where we were in Alice Lake, I thought, here I was, so concerned about my own perspective, making sure that the kids knew what this was going to mean in the family context, and making sure that they, you know, they, they were so excited about you know, my new job, that I failed to appreciate that they were prepared to throw away any emotional and physical proximity to their mother if it meant that they could get the front line of the pet store. And, and so I say that, sort of, you know, it's a true story, but it, it's one that actually you know, really got me in the gut in terms of understanding the perspective of someone else. Another quick story, very different context. Um, not that long ago, I guess just probably just before Christmas, I was a lunch, at a lunch with a, a bunch of business and community leaders and many people whose names you would recognize. One of the people at the table was uh, Kim Campbell. Uh, There's probably 10, maybe, maybe 12 people around the table. Uh, two women, Kim and myself, and the rest were guys. Sorry, Victoria, it won't be that way when you grow up. It'll be all girls, and we'll have way more fun. But anyhow, um, 10 guys, two girls. And, and we were having a pretty far-reaching uh, conversation about Canada, the economy, uh, etc. And one of the gentlemen uh, said, well, I'd like to hear from you two about the glass ceiling. I thought, seriously, dude? Okay. Uh, because, you know, you've obviously smashed through the glass ceiling. And then there was quite a, com quite a commentary around the table of, of fairly militaristic um, anecdotes about how Kim and I must have um, loaded the cannons to smash through the glass ceiling. And after about the fourth or fifth person made comments along these lines, Kim Campbell, who is completely irreverent, if, if you've ever spent time with her, uh, says, look, let's just get that one thing really clear. There ain't no glass ceiling, it's a thick layer of men. <laughs> and I thought, again, <laughs> It was brilliant in the moment. You've never seen 10 male CEOs stopped dead in their tracks as quickly. And I'm not turning this into a gender discussion, but it's, it's about perspective. You know, the glass ceiling, impenetrable, solid, hard, thick layer of men, you can navigate. It's an obstacle. People can choose to get out of your way. People can choose to help you. Perspective. Perspective is super important as you go forward in your lives and your businesses to make sure that you stop and check and understand your own perspective. Easier said than done, by the way. And that you l listen to yourself and try and learn and embrace the perspective of the other person or organization before you, before you act or react. So the second thing I want to talk about is, um, am, I, am I really creating a problem here? Can I just, can you hear this? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's way better. Good. Although I was enjoying pretending I was on The Voice or something. But anyhow, OK. Um, so that's perspective. So now let's talk a little bit about performance. Oh my god, this is so much more comfortable. Um, so a little bit about performance. You know, right now, and, and you as a group have an interesting um, demographic in terms of your, your age range. Some, some of you are um, as mature and probably much, much wiser than I am. And some of you actually look like the same age as my kids. So you've got quite a wide perspective of, uh, perspective of age. Uh, but when it comes to thinking about performance, one of the things that I, I notice these days, especially with some of our younger generations, you know, my kids' generation, sort of 20 to 35, let's say, um, is that we are uh, in danger of becoming perpetually partially engaged. We have so many data points coming at us, and we are so focused on task and doing what and doing what faster that I hope we take the time to stand back and ask ourselves, why? Why are we doing this? Why am I in this business? Why am I trying to build my new resort, sell my, uh, sell my cider, et cetera? And what am I trying to get out of life? This is the value stuff. And I'm not talking about corporate values. I'm not talking about the values page that you may or may not have on your website. I'm not talking about 
you know, getting the t-shirt or reading the textbook that says values. I'm talking about having the, giving yourself permission, if you will, to stand back and have that conversation with yourself about what do I really want out of life. Um, I'm a big fan of the Disney approach to this um, that's founded on uh, a statement from Roy Disney years ago now uh, that if you know your values, decision making becomes much easier. The decisions themselves might not be easy, but knowing what decision you need to make becomes a lot easier if you know your values. And I'll tell you a little story around this one as well. And all of my, all of my stories involve um, my family. So uh, again, reaching back to probably um, 10 or 12 years ago, um, I was um, very busy being that managing partner. And my husband was in the movie business and um, uh, I used to feel, you know, very sorry for myself being a lawyer and how hard we worked. The guys in the movie business just worked insane hours uh, and, and all very higgledy-piggledy. So we had three little girls and we were almost like ships passing in the night. Like quite literally, I'd be heading out of the, out of the house to go to the office and Brad would just be coming in from an overnight shoot. And it would be like, hey, have a good night. Yeah, I had a good night. Yeah, see you when. Oh. Um, and, and that seemed like that's what we were supposed to do. Um, so I, uh, I actually used to sit on the board of the Canada Revenue Agency. Gosh, remember, glad I'm not there now. But anyhow, um, no heart bleeds then. Uh, but anyhow, it was the it used to be called the Canada Customs and Revenue Agency, and um, and we sat the board meets at in a very ostentatious oak paneled ball, uh, boardroom atop uh, a building in uh, in Ottawa, uh, and very very formal formal board setting. And uh, so I'm sitting there and we're in the middle of the meeting. It's just, actually we're just come back from lunch and um, one of the uh, assistants comes in and she's got one of those little pink um, telephone slips. Um, in the olden days when we had telephones rather than texts and emails, that's what we used to get messages on. Anyhow, she comes in and she walks over to me and I'm thinking, oh God. And it's folded in half and it opens, it opens up and it says, phone home urgent. That's all it says, phone home urgent. So um, I have, at that point, um, sort of mind check, okay, I've got three kids, kindergarten, grade two, grade three in school. I've got a husband who's shooting a Rocky movie outside of Pemberton at a fly-in only camp, and I've got a nanny at home. How many ways can that picture go wrong? A lot of ways, right? And I have to ex extricate myself from the meeting without decomposing into a ball of blubbering jelly because I was so nervous about what would happen uh, when I made the call. So anyhow, I make the call, cut a long story short, Nanny is in hospital. She's been taken to hospital emergency and um, I get this from Nanny's friend who is at home and she wants to know who's gonna pick up the kids. Okay, um, interesting question. Um, easy for some people to answer, not for us. We have no family within about 400 miles of Vancouver. Um, the person who would normally pick up the children, of course, is in the emergency ward. And I realized at that moment, we don't really know our neighbors, uh, don't really know the, f the families of our kids' friends. Um, all of my friends work, and they're all busy at work. And what the heck am I gonna do? And so I immediately act, I don't, I don't do the values thing at that point. I immediately act. Well, I guess I, I'm based on values. I didn't want my kids wandering the streets. Because um, I had a kid coming out of, out of kindergarten in about two and a half hours. Uh, long story short, find, uh, find one of our nanny's friends who can go pick up the children. And I didn't go back into the CCRA boardroom. I thought, you know, what, what am I doing with my life? Why am I doing this? Did I actually have three children so that a third party could raise them as my husband and I are ships passing in the night in the driveway at, at seven in the morning. And why am I doing this? Packed my bags, um, got on the plane, and from Ottawa back to Vancouver, wrote my resignation letter from the firm. And phoned the, phoned the movie uh, producing, the producer's office, and said, uh, I have to get my husband out of the shoot. It's an emergency. You could only, you could only get them out, it came out on the weekends, 
You can only get them out other than weekends on emergency. I said, it's family emergency, I need to get them out. Uh, what is it? Can't tell you. So my husband's flying back from Pemberton, well, flying into Pemberton and then driving back from Pemberton, not knowing what's going on. We arrive at home and um, I've got my resignation letter from uh, Faskins written. And I was pretty confident. I had five hours on the flight to think about how I was going to do this. So I tell them what's going on. Um, Nanny is fine. Everybody got home okay. Everybody was safe, sound, etc. But I said, look, you know, this just doesn't work. For the sake of our kids and our family, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to resign. And he says, you're out of your mind again. Um, <laughs> I will resign. At which point I just about fell on the floor laughing. Um, well, what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to take care of the kids. Okay, this is not a new age domesticated male, okay? Um, <laughs> Uber athlete, hockey player, um, uh, aggressive snowboarder, etc. Uh, and I said, you know, <laughs> nice try, pal. We've got three girls. And, um, you know, I, I don't think you even know where the eggs are in the fridge. They just kind of magically appear on your plate in the morning. Um, and he says, no, no, give it a, let me give it a try. Um, long story short, and I can tell you the children's reaction to all of that, which was mind-blowing at how early our children roll cast us as mothers and fathers, i.e., mummy, um, uh, you cannot tell the teacher this. It's too embarrassing. Nobody has a boy nanny. Um, honey, it's not a nanny, it's dad. <laughs> it's the same thing. If he's not going to work, he's a nanny. This is five years old. Okay, five years old. So anyhow, long story short, um, we make that decision, and we endure, I will say, we endure for many years a lot of criticism. A lot of criticism that goes something like this. You probably felt really guilty, Sue, about how hard you worked before, now don't you feel really guilty that your husband's staying home? Actually, no, but now that you've mentioned it, maybe I should. Um, my point in, you know, of course, all of the jokes with my husband about, you know, being the, um, you know, the hockey mom and, and whatnot. Um, but he's still at home. The kids are now well gone, so I'm not entirely sure what he does at home. But anyhow, that's okay. Um, that's okay. Uh, uh, but my point is, we made a decision that was life-changing for our family, had huge consequences in a number of contexts. We basically cut our income in half that day. Uh, and it's a decision that was the best decision I have made in my life, other than marrying the guy that I chose to marry. Uh, and it was totally based on values. And given the chance to make that decision again, I wouldn't hesitate. And so my point is, when you, when you have values, and when you stand back and say to yourself, what are my values? And then you govern your life's decisions, whether it's your business or, or your personal life or your family life or your social life, you govern yourself by those values. Uh, you are on a path to fulfillment and happiness, much more so than if you don't have those values. At least that's, that's been my experience, and it's still, it still is today. Uh, my experience. So, um, so where does all this where does all this take us? I actually had some nice notes written out about what I was going to say, and I threw them all out the window when I was. Um, some of you probably saw me writing furiously at the back of the room because I threw them out in terms of um, listening to what you said and what I thought I might want to talk about. So, um, so make sure that you know what the perspective on an issue is, and you know what the other person's perspective is. Um, give yourself the permission. To, uh, to, to identify your values and make sure they're your values, not somebody else is telling you what your values are. Um, it, they're not value, you won't find these on the internet. Um, there, I'm sure there is a web page on, on how to identify your values, but um, a long walk and fresh air and water is a much better way to identify your values than, than the internet, I think. And, and then really try and live your values. So where does that, um, where does that take us? It takes us to promise. And, um, and, and this is where, I, I gotta tell you, I, um, I was absolutely blown away, amazed, inspired, um, taken aback, shocked uh, at the presentations that I saw this morning. Um, absolutely remarkable. And you are amazing women. 
uh, your innovators, your entrepreneurs, your business leaders. Um, you know that there will be challenges and obstacles. I'm sure um, you have covered and, and navigated more challenges and obstacles um, than most anybody uh, in your age and stage of life. Never, ever, ever forget to celebrate who you are and what you have done, especially on some of those crappy days. Um, and what I want to say about promise is um, you are the promise of the future, but you're also the promise of today. What you are doing is a huge part of the social fabric of this country. Um, you are driving a huge part of British Columbia and thereby Canada's success. And don't underestimate um, the importance of, of that and the reality of that. You are actually changing how Canada does business and who we are as a society. And you are continuing along a pathway of, an, of a legacy that was created by many other women who've gone before you. For example, for example, um, as we know, two uh, of the most progressive provinces in this world are current, or provinces in this country are currently led by women premiers. Okay, it was six last year, um, and it's two now, but that will, will rebalance that again. Um, and the economic and social policies in British Columbia and Ontario created by Christy and, and Kathleen uh, Wynne are, are beyond the pale Re, uh, more progressive relative to the other provinces of Canada, save and except perhaps uh, Alberta. And that's, that's, not, that's completely blind to political stripe. I don't care about the political stripe when I make that comment. I look at what those women are doing. Um, the, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada, Bev McLaughlin, is a woman. Um, she's been the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada for 14 years. For 14 years, the leading jurist in this country has been a female. And, and if you, I don't, I don't suggest you read Supreme Court of Canada decisions. Okay, you've got way more important things to do. But what I can tell you is that the social policy that comes out of, of the decisions of the court led by Bev McLaughlin um, have, uh, have her fingerprints all over it. There is a funny story, though, I have to tell you. When, when she was um, uh, first appointed to the, to the bench, not when she was... Um, Chief Justice. I think she was put, appointed to the bench in 89. She's been there a long time. Um, the only other female justice at the time when Bev was appointed, uh, she comes back from taking the oath. The only other female justice at the time leans over to her and says, two down, seven to go. Um, there's nine justices on the Supreme Court of Canada. Anyhow, um, but, but the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada is a woman, and we are one of the very few jurisdictions um, that have a woman uh, leading our uh, leading our judiciary. Um, we've got the likes of Elise Allen, CEO of, of GE Canada, um, Kathleen Taylor, the, the newly announced uh, chair of the uh, board of directors of RBC. Uh, we've got Angie Ardini, uh, Sarah Morgan Sylvester, and Carol Taylor, incoming, current, and outgoing chancellors of either SFU or UBC. And we have you guys. That's who you're, that, that's, that's who you are following. That's who, Victor, where the hell did Victoria go? Oh, okay. Um, that's who, Victoria's watching you. I watched them. I watched Bev McLaughlin and, and Christy and, and Kathleen and whatnot. I watched them. The women of Canada, the young women of Canada are watching you. I'm not trying to put pressure on you at all. You've got enough pressure. What I'm trying to tell you is you are making a huge difference to who we are as a country. And, um, and when I watched you this morning and I, and I listened to, um, uh, to Angela and the art box, which I do have to read because you had a, a Kia bag folded over it, so I couldn't read it. But you, you listened to, to how you presented and how you came up with that idea. Um, and, uh, and where's the jewelry gal, Lux Jewelry? Where's our jewelry? Yeah, the jewelry. And, and just thinking about what you, what you went, the emotional energy that you put into those designs and your presentation. And of course, the um, irrepressible rapper, 
Um, for those of you that didn't see it, uh, Corrine is a pretty kick, <laughs> kick butt rapper. Um, but just the whole concept of, of bringing the outside in, bringing the outside in both geographically in terms of how you're sourcing your product, but also what you do in terms of um, helping us enjoy greenery, whether it's, uh, whether it's real or fake. Um, and, and on they went, um, uh, Allison and your, um, your little scholars program. Where are you? There you are. Um, uh, want to, you, you, actually, you actually are changing the world. And I, and I think Haig Ferris noted that. And Allison's, uh, you guys probably know all these businesses, right? Um, really changing how preschool education is done. And um, oh my gosh, don't we all want to be at Quadra Island? I love Quadra Island, actually. I'm, big, I'm a big fisher, so I know your place. Uh, but, but redeveloping that. Uh, and then where's our cheeky chops? There you are. Um, I, I actually needed you 25 years ago. You're a bit late for me. Um, but, uh, and then of course we have um, the ladies from left field who are, who are not actually changing the world. They're just getting drunk, but they're gonna have fun. <laughs> they're gonna have fun doing it. Um, and so as I watched your presentations, um, each one of you, um, you, together you painted a picture for me of the future of the British Columbia economy and the entrepreneurial economy that is amazingly inspiring because you're so different um, and yet you approach your businesses with an energy, an enthusiasm, a passion, uh, a pragmatism that is, for an old broad like me, absolutely inspiring. And, um, and I know, I, I know 30 years ago, when I was starting my career, I, I did not have the self-assurance, the, co the confidence, um, and the presence that you have. Um, and, and so I, I just want to say in, cl in closing, because I think we want to have a few questions, um, you know, I could not be more proud and excited about you and your businesses and what you're going to do for British Columbia, and, and in a very selfish way, what you're going to do for my kids. Because my kids are watching you. And, uh, and so I'll come back to where I started. Your someday is right now, and there ain't nothing that you guys aren't going to be able to do. So thank you very, very much for letting me, uh, letting me say a few things. Um, now, questions? I'll, tell, I'll just tell you a little story about questions because we did this once in the law firm. This is, this is, we, we still laugh about this. A few, there weren't very many women uh, partners in the law firm many years ago, and there were a lot of young women associates who were, were trying to figure out how they navigated the world. And so we got them all together uh, for an afternoon session, wine and cheese thing, uh, and the young women associates said, um, uh, we would prefer to submit our questions in writing rather than stand up and ask them. And we thought, all right, um, that's fine. Seems a little weird, but okay. And then we realized why. We got three pages of questions, and we still remember question number five. And so there was a panel of, I think there were four of us women partners, and maybe about 40 young women in the room. And question five, how do you find time for sex? So um, <laughs> I'm not sure I'm ready to go that far with you guys, but any other boundaries um, don't exist. So fire away. Uh, how did I transition from the world of, well, first of all, I went to pharmacy, right? So as my, mo my mother said, who I love dearly, when I told her I was leaving PharmaSave and, and going to Life Labs, uh, she said, that's wonderful, dear. You're going from selling drugs to sucking blood out of people. That's <laughs> wonderful. Um, so how, do, well, I'll tell you, and it gets back a little bit to values. So um, in the law firm uh, industry, uh, the managing partner position is a term limited position. You're not there forever. Uh, it's an elected position. So uh, I, two, three year terms. So, oh, did I just kick my water over? Sorry. Um, two, three year terms. So when I was close to the end of my second term, I let our executive board know that by the way, <laughs> I'm done and I will be moving on. And uh, there was lots of machinations about changing the partnership agreement so that I could stay on longer. I said, no, you know, there's a reason why there's term limits. I accept those. Uh, and so then there was a lot of discussion about, okay, now what am I going to do? Because I was a little different than most managing partners demographically. Um, I was the first female managing partner um, in the firm. And uh, for the six years, the only female managing partner of a law firm large law firm in Canada. There was one duo in, 
in Ontario for a while, and then Lisa Volt was here for a little while. But um, it, I was a bit of an oddity, and I was also young. Um, much young. Most of the managing partners were older guys who then went into retirement. So, um, so lots of discussion about, you know, what, now what are you going to do? And a couple of guys said, well, you should go back to practice. And I'm not very good at doing the go back thing. So I thought, mm-hmm. And then there was a thought, well, we're going to change our governance structure. Why don't you be the managing partner of the whole law firm out of Toronto? I thought, mm, don't do the Toronto thing. Um, so I quit. Uh, I left the law firm. And um, that was a bit of a surprise to everybody. Um, they thought I was going to go compete. And I said, no. And they said, what are you going to do? I said, I, I don't know. I don't know. I'll find something. Um, th- another funny story. I told my kids this. And um, they said, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know. You know, I'll find something. And that same middle child said, are we going to have to go on welfare? (laughs) And I said, I hope not. (laughs) I hope not. I'll try my best. I'll go find that pet store job. Uh, Anyhow, I was at the time, I was on the board of directors of PharmaSafe. And I'd been on that board for quite a while. And I actually was on the HR committee. So I knew we were searching for a CEO because our guy was retiring. And they asked me if I would throw my name in the ring. It was actually astonishing when I put my name out the number of people that phoned, it was bizarre. Um, and some of them might say, are you kidding me? I would never do that. But you say it politely. Um, and then there are other ones where they'd say, you know, would you like to consider this? And I'd be like, oh, gosh, you know, I don't think I can do that. So anyhow, the PharmaSafe guys asked if I'd like to think about that. And I said, yeah. And so I took that job uh, and loved it. I, I loved being a CEO. And, and CEO jobs do have a horizon, I think. There is a best before date with a lot of CEOs. Some, some can survive, but um, I knew that I'd sort of gone as far as I, I could probably go with PharmaSave. And the same kind of thing happened with the Life Labs gang. I was on the Life Labs board. And, uh, and uh, they, I actually was at a board meeting. As you can probably tell, I'm not that quiet at board meetings. And uh, so I was at a board meeting, and I had been particularly talkative and I got a call from uh, the board chair that night at my hotel. And he said, could you come down to the Borealis office? Borealis owns Life Labs. It's a sub of the Omer's pension plan. So we're private. Uh, he said, can you come down for coffee tomorrow morning at the Borealis offices? And I said, uh, oh, yeah, OK. Anything in particular? He goes, no, we just want to chat. And so then I'm thinking, oh my god, what did I do in the board meeting? Like, the, I, I, was, I was sure I was getting fired off the board, right? And so I finally emailed him. I said, look, I'd like to be prepared for the meeting. What do I need to be prepared for? And he said, just a good conversation. Don't worry. I'm like, mm, OK. And so I go down there, and, and there he is with the president of, of Borealis and the president of Omers. And uh, they said, we'd like you to be our CEO, because uh, we were in a search there too. And I said, no. Uh, <laughs> and he said, well, that wasn't supposed to be. That's not the answer you're supposed to give. I said, I'm a BC-based girl. And uh, I'm not moving to Toronto. He goes, good, that's the right answer. We want you to live in both places. And I thought, dang, he's a smart guy. <laughs> so that's what I do. So the transition was really, um, that's the journey. Um, being a managing partner of a law firm is being a business leader. That's the way I approached it. And that's what CEOs do, lead businesses. So it hasn't been hard at all. Um, my husband and I have talked quite um, extensively about him possibly staying home. Yeah. Um, we currently yep. have two kids in daycare, and it's, it's a sore spot. Yeah, it's hard. Yeah. I love them, but, yeah. you know. Um, anyways, just how did you guys... How did we do it? You obviously got to that point where you needed to do it. Yeah, yeah, and I feel your emotion. Uh, it takes me back uh, many years. Um, uh, we had that crisis point, right? We had that that moment of, uh, that holy crap moment of what do you, you know, what am I actually doing that got me there? Um, uh, but what we ended up doing is we, we just sat down and said what's best for the kids. Yeah. And we didn't factor finances into it at all. Finances were not an issue and, and, um, and we were prepared to make the decision for the kids. We decided we wanted to uh, raise the kids um, as, and, 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 it, and that's a values based decision. It's not a social policy decision for Canada. It's not a political comment. We decided we wanted to have a, a stay at home parent. That was a decision we decided we wanted to make. And, uh, and then the question was um, who should do it? And obviously, I thought I would be best. Um, and Brad, being the ever practical guy, which I am not always uh, the practical one. 
uh, he said, look, I'm in the movie biz. I can come back and forth. Because in the movie biz, you work on sort of a contract basis. You work on a show. And he said, look, if it doesn't work out, I can go back to a show. And, but if you leave the law firm, like, that's going to be really hard to get back in. Uh, so we made it on a very practical basis. Then we talked to the kids, which was very tricky. Uh, our nanny was quite fine with it. And, and then we, we um, held our breath and jumped in the deep end. And sometimes that's what you have to do, is you have to hold hands and jump in the deep end together with your life partner. And, um, and I'll tell you, it was hell. It was hell and shocking for the first year to see how people reacted to it. There were a few, a few, like that many, who said, wow, that's really cool, that's really interesting, including my mom, by the way, who, who said, wow, that, you know, some, it was something along the lines of, well, you finally made a good decision for your family. <laughs> that's as good as it gets with my mom. That's a compliment, okay? I love my mom dearly. She's a bit of a, bit of a sergeant general. But, um, but people who I had to that point considered real friends made that, you know, don't you feel guilty comment. Um, Brad, got, uh, Br Brad got put through the ringer like you would not believe by the guy crowd and by some of our friends. Um, and you just have to hold hands and keep swimming through the, through the deep end until you get to the shallow end. And we've had a phenomenal journey. Our kids are so much better off, and I say this with all seriousness, our kids are so much better off having had uh, Brad stay home than they would have if I'd stayed home, because he is such a different guy than, um, such a different person than me. And I have a lot of influence on them, because girls hang out with their moms a lot. Even when they're teenagers and you don't want them to hang out with you, they still will hang out with you sometimes. Um, so you, you There's just. There's a big difference in the stress level and being able to concentrate on the OK, here's how it works. OK, here's how it works. Um, two quick stories, and I know you want to wrap this up. Um, two quick stories. Um, I came home one day um, very shortly after we'd made the move, so maybe three or four months after we'd actually um, made the move and Brad was home full time. And our eldest daughter, Diana, um, was sitting at the kitchen bar. When you come in our house and go through the entryway, there's a, we've got a, you go right into the kitchen. There's a bar there. And she was sitting there holding her head like this. And she had like major dental work, like major braces. And, um, and she's holding her head. And I went, oh, honey. She, I said, what's wrong? She goes, oh, mommy, my braces hurt. And I immediately, I, immediately, I didn't take off my coat. I was like, OK, I'm going to phone Dr. Pocock. I'll change my um, appointments for tomorrow. We'll get you into Dr. Pocock first thing. She goes, Mommy, I've been in the orthodontist all day. Daddy was with me at Dr. Pocock. Can we cuddle? Do you know how easy it is? Do you know how easy it is to come home from a day at work and your kid wants to cuddle on the couch as compared to you know, the rapid fire? I've got to fix this problem. Um, so, so you know, that's, I mean, I've got a, I've got a million stories like that. Um, and, like, it's just, it, I, I said this to the executive committee at Faskins, who were all guys at the time, and I was the managing partner. So um, <laughs> it was, again, this was around Christmas time. And, um, I don't know, we were having some conversation around my family life for some reason. And I said, you know one thing I figured out, you guys? It's way easier to be a high-performing partner when you're in a single-income family. And none of them knew what I meant. They're all like, huh? What are you talking Like, they, seriously. And I love them dearly, and they're massively wonderful people and, in, and brilliant lawyers. They did not understand. Why? No perspective. They had no perspective. None of them had ever lived in a double-income family. And I remember saying this one guy, OK, who mails your Christmas cards? He didn't even know they sent Christmas cards. <laughs> you know? So it, it, it just makes life easier. It depends on what you want out of your life, though, right? It made my life and Brad's life easier, we think. There was one more, and then we got to go. Go ahead. Um, I would just love to hear, as a busy professional, what the yeah. value, um, and I know that there's lots, but what the value of, of board work and why you prioritize that over yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, well, I'm a, I'm a huge believer that one of the worst things we can do is talk to people who are like ourselves. And, um, and in the legal business, um, 
And, and I think a lot of professions are like this, that famous middle daughter, she's now an accountant, and the accountants all hang out together. When I was practicing, the lawyers, they all hang out together. The lawyers talk lawyer stuff, right? And I got, I got a little worried that maybe examining the depth of one's navel was not the best approach uh, to being successful and happy. And I'll tell you how I got spurred into that thinking. A very good friend of mine at the time, uh, Bev Voice, uh, was the executive vice president for Scotiabank and a client of the firm's. She was the first female to reach that level, et cetera, et cetera. I was the first managing partner, et cetera, et cetera, to be a female, et cetera. And at that time, Scotiabank held a program called um, Something Something for Entrepreneurs. I can't remember what it was, uh, the title. But they were putting these little groups together of uh, women from various parts of the community. And you'd sort of get together once a month and have a little sort of peer counseling sort of support group kind of thing. And, and I thought it, it was amazing. Like I had this young woman who was like 19 who ran a catering company. We had Bev for, who was a banker. We had a lady who ran a HR department in one of the big hospitals. And, and just to listen to their lives and what they went through every day, I found super <laughs> fulfilling. So that was step one. Then step two, one of the ladies in that group was Catherine Adrian, who was the founder of Please Mom. And so Catherine said to me, have you ever thought of becoming uh, part of, uh, the heck's it called? Um, YPO, YPO. You guys know YPO, Young Presidents Organization. So YPO is is a is sort of a uh, organization for um, CEOs of comp and and founders. It's very much entrepreneurs um, of companies of a certain size. So um, uh, I I said okay, well that sounds that sounds interesting. That will broaden my perspective. Uh, so I applied, uh, went through a very rigorous um, application process, and I was declined. Um, but the guy who reported to me was accepted. So I thought, hmm, that's interesting. Um, uh, and I thought, I still want to try and find out how I can get this perspective. And much to my surprise, a few of the guys on the recruiting committee for YPO phoned me up and said, hey, you know, we didn't really like how that ended up. Uh, let's start a separate parallel group. And since for t oh, 12 years now, we have had a forum group running parallel to YPO uh, that is focused on having people in it who don't fit the, the mold for YPO. And we've had phenomenal, phenomenal people in that group. There's been a core of five of us that have been there, I guess, for 12 years, 10 or 12 years. And then a couple of new ones have come in. Um, and that's a group we now have folks who are primarily corporate directors. So Alice LaBerge, I don't know if anybody knows Alice LaBerge. Alice is, uh, on the bank, uh, the, the board of directors for Royal Bank, uh, Potash Corp, Russell Metals, UBC, and and you listen to the kinds of things that that you deal with at that level, and I thought that was cool. So that's one way I got into it. The other way I got into it is an old pal of mine from university phoned me up when I was a baby lawyer, and said, uh, "You should sit on the BCIT Foundation board of directors." I didn't even know what that was, um, but. Uh, uh, she was Karen Harris, a good friend of mine. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll do this for you. And I remember walking into a boardroom, it was like this, it was like this. And there were people like Wynne Powell, who was the CEO of London Drugs at the time, and Marty Slotnick, and Don Ricks, who was the founder of Life Labs, sitting in a room. And I just, I just wanted to crawl under the table. I thought, what can I possibly say in this room that is useful? And I sat there for two meetings and I listened to these people shape the future of BCIT, and I was blown away. And so I thought, wow, this is a really cool thing to do. That's community, community board. And so I got involved in community boards and then went into corporate boards as a way of, on the community side, uh, giving back. I mean, I, I, I honestly do think I'm one of the luckiest people on the planet. I really do. I mean, I, I mean my life has just been privileged. And so that's a way to give back. And then it was a way to broaden my perspective and, and be a bit more of a wholesome person. And then it was hugely fun. You get to hang out with really cool people. So that's why I did it. And I still do it. I sit on a bunch of boards and I love it.